Thanks so much for coming out to hear me talk about my favorite topic, probabilistic programming. Uh, I thought I'd introduce myself real quick. I'm recently ro relocated back to Germany after uh, studying at Brown, where I did my PhD on Bayesian modeling and where we studied decision making. And uh, for a couple of years, I've also been uh, working with Quantopian, which is a Boston-based startup and, uh, as a quantitative researcher. And there we are building the world's first algorithmic trading platform in the web browser. Uh, the talk will be tangentially related. Um, so I'm going to say, I'm gonna just going to show you that screenshot of what it looks like. Uh, so this is essentially what you see when you go on the website. It's a web-based IDE where you can code Python and code up your trading strategy, and then we provide historical data so that you can test how your algorithm would have done uh, if it was, I don't know, 2012. And then on the right here, you see how well it did and often, and that's what I'll refer back to. You were interested in whether you beat the market or lose against the market. And also, I should add, it's completely free and everyone can use it. Okay, so I think at every talk, that should be the main question as well. Why should you care about probabilistic programming, right? Um, and it's not really um, an easy talk just because talking about probabilistic programming, you need to have at least a basic understanding of uh, some concepts of probability theory and statistics. So the first 20 minutes, I will just give a very quick primer focusing on an intuitive level of understanding. Uh, can I get a quick show of hands? Like who sort of understands on an intuitive level how Bayes' formula works? Okay, so most of you. So um, maybe you won't even need that primer, but uh, it might still be interesting. And towards the end, then, we have a simple example and then a more advanced example that should be interested even if you know um, already quite a bit about Bayesian statistics. So to motivate this further, uh, I really like uh, this um, contrast that Olivier gave at his uh, talk about machine learning. And that is, chances are you are a data scientist maybe and you use scikit-learn to train your uh, machine learning classifiers. So what this looks like is on the left you have data, then the that you use to train your algorithm, and then you, that algorithm makes predictions. And if those predictions are all you care about, then that, that might be fine, right? But one central problem that most of these algorithms have is that it, they're very bad at conveying what they have learned. So it's very difficult to inquire what goes on in this black box right here. So on the other hand, probabilistic programming is inherently open box. And I think the best way to think about this is that it is a statistical toolbox for you to create these very rich models that are really tailored to the specific data that you're working with. And then you can inquire that model and really see what's going on and what was learned so that you can learn something about your data rather than just making predictions, right? And the other big benefit, I think, and we'll see that later, is that these um, type of models work with um, a so-called black box inference engine, which are sampling algorithms that work across a huge variety of models. So you don't really have to worry about the inference step. All you have to do is basically build that model and then hit the inference button. And in most cases, you'll just get uh, the answers that you're looking for. So there's not really much in terms of solving equations, which is always nice. So throughout this talk, I want to use um, a very simple example that uh, most of you will be familiar with, and that is uh, A-B testing. As you know, when you have two websites and you want to know which one works better in some measure that you're interested in, maybe the conversion rate or how many users click on an ad, what do you do to test that? So you split your users into two groups and give group one website A and give group two website B, and then you want to look which um, had the higher measure, right? That problem is, of course, much more general, and since I'm coming more from a finance background, uh, I'm gonna sort of switch back and forth between the, statistically speaking, identical problem, where you have two trading algorithms, and you wanna know which one has a higher chance of beating the market on each day. So, here, I'm just going to generate some data um, to basically see what the trivial answers, trivial answers that you might come up with uh, yield. 
and how we can improve upon that. And um, you might be surprised that I'm not using real data, but I think that is actually a critical step, is before you apply your model on real data, you should always use simulated data where you really know what's going on and the parameters that you want to recover so that you know that your model works correctly and only then you can be sure that you'll get correct answers by applying it to real data, right? So the, da the data that we're going to work with it will be binary, so just Boolean events, and that type of um, statistics, statistical process called a Bernoulli, um, and that is essentially just a coin flip, right? The probabilities of coin flips. And I can use that from SciPy stats, and then I call it Bernoulli, and here I pass in the probability of that coin of coming up heads, or that algorithm of beating the market on a particular day, or that website um, the, of converting a user. And here I'm sampling 10 trials. So this will be the result, right? Just a bunch of binary uh, zeros and ones. So I'm generating two algorithms, um, one with 50%, one with 60%. So you want to know which one is better. The easiest thing that you, might wanna, that you might come up with is just, well, let's take the mean, right? And actually, statistically speaking, that's not a terrible idea, and it's called the maximum likelihood estimate. And if you ask an applied mathematician um, what you should do, then that might be the answer. And I, I took a cause in applied math, um, and the proofs always work in a very similar way. You basically have this problem, and then you say, well, okay, let's have um, our data go to infinity, and then you solve, and then you get um, the estimator works correctly in that case. And that's great, but what do you do if you don't have an infinite amount of data, right? And that's the much more likely case that you be in. And that, I think, is where Bayesian statistics really work well. So what happens in our case now, where I just take the mean of the data I just generated? As you can see, um, in this case, uh, we, get, we estimate that the chance of this algorithm beating the market is 10% and 40% for the other one. So obviously, that's completely wrong. I used 50 and 60% to generate it. And the obvious answer of why this goes wrong is just I was unlucky and the observant members in the audience will have noticed that I used a particular random seed here. So I found that, I took that random seed to produce this very weird sequence of events um, that basically produced this pattern. But certainly that can happen with real data, right? You can't just be unlucky and uh, the first 10 visitors of your website uh, just just don't click. And the central thing that I think is missing here is the uncertainty in that estimate, right? 10%, 40%, that's just a number, but we're missing how confident we are in that number. So for the remainder of the talk, that will be a recurring topic, is really trying to quantify that uncertainty. Uh, then you might um, say, well, uh, there's this huge branch of statistics, frequentist statistics, uh, which designed these statistical tests to um, decide which one of those two is better or whether there is a significant difference. Then you might run a t-test, and that returns a probability value that indicates how likely are you to observe that data if it was generated by chance. And th you, that's certainly the correct thing to do, but one of the central problems with frequentist statistics is that it's incredibly easy to misuse it. For example, um, you, might on the, you might collect some data and the test doesn't turn up anything, and then on the next day you get more data, so what do you do? Well, you just run another test with, um, with all the data you have now, right? You have more data, so the test should be more accurate. Unfortunately, that's not the case. And you can see that here I just create a very simple um, example where I do that procedure, I generate 50 random binaries with 50% probability both, so there is no difference between them. And then I start with just two events, I run a t-test. If that is not significant, then I do three, I run a t-test, right? So that, just that uh, process of continuously adding data and testing whether there's a difference. And if there's a difference of smaller than 0.05, then I return true. If it isn't, then I return false. And then I return that a thousand times, and I look at what the probability is that even though there is no statistical, there is no difference at all between those two, they're both 0.5, what is the chance of this test 
yielding um, an answer that it's that there is a significant difference, and it's 36. 0.6% in that case, which is also absurdly high, right? So this procedure really fails if you use it in that way. And granted, I, I misused the test, uh, right? It's not designed to work in that specific scenario, but it's extremely common that people do that. And for me, one of the central problems is that frequent statistics really are dependent on your intentions of collecting the data. So if you use a different procedure of collecting the data, for example, let's say what I just did, I just add data every day, uh, then you need a different statistical test. And if you think about this more, it's actually pretty crazy, right? If, you just, if you're a data scientist and you just get data from a database, you have no idea what the intentions were of gathering that data, right? So, and you wanna be very free in exploring that data set and running all kinds of uh, statistical tests to see what's going on. So I think while frequent statistics is certainly not wrong, it's often um, very constricting in what it allows you to do. And if you don't do things correctly, you might uh, shoot yourself in the foot. And I think that's really uh, a good setup for Bayesian statistics. And I'm just gonna introduce that very quickly. So at the core, we have Bayes formula and if you don't know what that is, essentially it's just a formula that tells us how to update our beliefs when we observe data. That implies that we have prior beliefs about the world that we have to formalize, and then here we apply, then we see data and we apply for base formulas to update our beliefs in light of that new data to give us our posterior. And in general, these beliefs are represented as random variables. And I'm also going to very quickly talk about what, what those are and what intuitive ways of thinking about those. So <laughs> statisticians like to call their parameters, their random variables, theta. So that's what I'm going to use here. And let's define a prior for our random variable theta. And theta will be the random variable about the algorithm beating the market, or a single algorithm beating the market, or the website converting a user, right? So what is the chance that that happens? Oops. So I didn't want to show that. I just wanted to show that. Um, so the best way to think about that random variable is as opposed to a, a variable that you might know from Python programming, which just has a single value, say, i equals five, is here we don't know the value, right? We want to reason about that value. We have some idea, some rough idea about that value. So rather than just having one, we, have, we allow for multiple values and assign each possible value a probability. And this is what that plot shows here. So on the x-axis, we have the possible states that the system can be in. For example, the algorithm can have a chance of 50% of beating the market. And I'm gonna assume that that is the most likely case. Just that's my personal prior belief without having seen anything. Um, I'm gonna assume that on average 50% is probably a good estimate, but I wouldn't be terribly surprised to see something with 60%, even though it's less likely. 80%, considerably less likely, but still possible. 100% that it like beats the market on every day, that, that I think would be next to impossible, right? So I'm gonna assign a very low probability to that. So I think that's a very intuitive way of thinking about that. So now let's see what happens if I observe data. And for that, I created this uh, widget here and where I can add data when I use this slider and then it will update that probability um, distribution down here. And so that will be our posterior, right? Currently there's no data available, so our posterior will just be our prior. So that is just the belief we have without having seen anything. And now I'm gonna add a single data point, a single success. So uh, we just ran the algorithm for a single day and it beat the market. So now, as you might have seen, the, the distribution here shifted a little bit to the right side, right? And that represents our updated belief that it's a little bit more likely now that the algorithm is generating positive returns. So, now let's reproduce that example from before where we had one success and nine uh, failures, right? Um, there was algorithm A and there we estimated it has a 10% chance of, of beating the market. So, and that was, that was ridiculous, right? With that amount of data, no way we could say that. 
And also with our prior knowledge, no way we would assume that 10% is actually the probability. So now I created that and is updating this probability distribution down here, which is now our updated belief that certainly with nine failures, we're gonna assume that there is a lower chance of success of that algorithm, which is represented by this distribution moving to the left. And, um, but still note that it's, that 10% is still extremely unlikely under this condition, right? And that is the influence of the prior. We said 10% is unlikely, so that will influence our estimates away from these very low values. The other thing to note is that the distribution is still pretty wide. So here now we have our uncertainty measure in the width of the distribution, right? The wider it is, the less certain I am about that particular value. So now I want you to, uh, in your head, just imagine what the distribution looked like if I move this up to 90 and the success up to 10, right? So basically now we're observing data that is in line with a hypothesis that it has 90% failure probability. So if you can, as you can see, the main thing that happens is it moves to the left, but also it gets much narrower. And that represents our increased confidence. With having seen more data, we have more confidence in that estimate. And that's exactly what we want. By the way, how cool is, is it that I can use these widgets in a live notebook? Okay, so where's the catch with all of that, right? This sounds a little bit too good to be true. You just like create that model and you update your beliefs and, and you're done, right? Fortunately, it's not always that easy. And one of the main difficulties is that this formula in the middle here uh, can, in, the most, in most cases, cannot be solved. In the case that I just showed you, it's extremely simple. You just apply Bayes' formula and you can solve it. And then um, you can compute your posterior analytically. But even with like just a tiny bit more complex models, you get multidimensional integrals over infinity that will make your eyes bleed and no sane human would be able to solve. So, and I think historically that's one of the main reasons why Bayes, which has been around since the 16th century, um, has not been used up until recently now where it's kind of having a renaissance, it's just people weren't able to, to solve for it. And the central idea of probabilistic programming is that, well, if you can't solve something, then we approximate it. And Luckily for us, there's this class of algorithms that are most commonly used called Markov Chain Monte Carlo. And instead of computing the posterior analytically, that curve that we've seen, it draws samples from it. That's about the next best thing uh, we can do. So just due to time constraints, I won't go into the details of uh, MCMC. So we're just gonna assume that it's pure black magic and and works, and it, it sort of is. It's kind of it's a very simple algorithm, but the fact that it works in such general cases is still mind blowing to me. Um, and the big benefit is that yeah, it can be applied very widely. So often you just define your model, you say go, and then it'll give you your posterior. So what does MCMC sampling look like? As we've seen before, this is the posterior that we want, right? This neat closed form solution, which we can't get in reality. So instead, we're gonna draw samples from that distribution. And if we have enough samples, we can do a histogram and then it'll start resembling uh, what it is. Okay, so let's get to PyMC3. PyMC3 is a probabilistic program framework written in Python and for Python. And it allows for construction of probabilistic models using intuitive syntax. And one of the reasons uh, for doing PyMC3 rather than two, maybe some of you has used PyMC2, PyMC3 is actually a complete rewrite. It uses no code uh, from PyMC2. There were a couple of reasons. One is just um, technological debt that the code base uh, of PyMC2 is, is pretty complex. It requires you to compile Fortran code, which always causes huge headaches for users to, to get working. So PyMC3 is actually very simple code. And one of the reasons is that we're using Theano for all things, um, for the whole compute engine. So um, basically we're just, compute, we're just creating that compute graph and then shifting everything off to Theano. And the other benefit we get from Theano is that it compiles, uh, that it can give us the gradient information of the model. And there's this new class of algorithms called Hamiltonian Monte Carlo that 
work that are um, advanced samplers, and those work even better in very complex models. So they're much more powerful, but they require that extra step, and that's not easy to get. Luckily for us, Theano provides that out of the box, so we don't really have to do, don't have to do anything. The other point I want to stress is that PyMC3 is very extensible, um, and also it allows you to interact with the model much more freely. So maybe you have used Jags or, or Winbugs or, or Stan, which is a other very interesting recent pro programming framework. And while those are really cool, one problem I personally have with them is that they require you to write your probabilistic program in this specific language. And then you compile that, you have some wrapper code to get the data into Stan, and then you have some wrapper code to get it out of Stan, the results. And for me, that is always very cumbersome, so you can't really see what's going on in the model, you can't debug it. So PyMC3, you can write your model in Python code and then really interact with it freely. So you never have to leave, essentially, Python, and that, for me, is, um, is, is very, very powerful. And so it, you can think of it much more as a library, and we'll see that in a second. Um, just the authors, so John Salvatier is the main guy who came up with it, and Chris von Espec, um, also programmed uh, quite a bit. Currently, we're still in alpha. It still works. Uh, it works fairly well already. The main reason why it's alpha is just um, mainly that we're missing good documentation. And we're currently writing those, but if you are up for it and would like to help out with that, that is certainly more than appreciated. Okay, so let's look at that model from our early example that we wanted to and see how we can solve it now in PyMC3. And for that, I'm just gonna write down that model, how you would write it in statistical terms. So we have these two random variables, right, that we wanna reason about, theta A and theta B, and that will represent the chance of the algorithm beating the market. And here we say this tilt means it's distributed as, so we're not working with numbers, but with distributions. So this is a, a beta distribution, and that is the distribution that we have been looking at at the beginning, right? Just from zero to one, if, you, if you're working with probabilities, the beta distribution is the one to use. And, um, so this is the thing that we want to reason, that we want to learn about given data. And then we, how do we learn about it? Well, we observe data, and the data that assimilated was binary, so that came from a Bernoulli distribution, so we have to assume that it's, that the data is distributed according to a Bernoulli distribution, so zeros and ones, and the probability of that Bernoulli distribution before just fixed 0.5, right? Here now, we actually want to infer that, so since we don't know that value, we replace it with a random variable, and that is the random variable theta a that we had above here. So that is how commonly these, these models look like. And the other point I want to make here is that here you really see how you are basically creating a, a generative model, right? So you, you might wonder, like, how can I construct my own model? And I think a good uh, path for that is to just think of how the data would have been generated, right? Here I know, well, there's this probability and it generated Bernoulli data, so that's the model I'm going to create. But you can get arbitrarily complex and then say, well, I have all these hidden causes that somehow relate in complex ways to the data, and then you're going to invert that model using Bayes' formula to infer these hidden causes. So here I'm just going to, again, generate data a little bit more now. So again, 50 and 60% probability of beating the market or conversion rate, and 300 values, and this is what the model looks like in PyMC3. So first we just import PyMC as PM, and we instantiate the model object, which will um, have all the random variables and, and whatnot. And the other improvement over PyMC2 is that everything you specify about your model, you do under this with context. And basically what that does is that it everything you do underneath here will be included in that model object so that you don't have to pass it in all the time. So underneath here now, 
this should look pretty familiar from before where I just had these random variables, right? Theta A distributed as a beta distribution. So here I now write the same, but in Python code, where I say, well, theta A is a beta distribution. We give it a name and we give it the two parameters and alpha and beta are the two parameters that this distribution takes, the number of successes and failures. So this is the, the prior that I showed you before that was centered around 50%. And I do the same thing for theta B. And now I'm gonna relate those random variables to my data. And as I said before, that's a Bernoulli, which I'm gonna instantiate, I give it a name. And instead of the a fixed p-value now, um, I give it the random variable, right, that we wanna link together. And since this is an observed node, we give it that array of 300 binary numbers that I generated a slide before, right? So this links it to the data and links it up to the random variable. And the same for uh, B. So up until here, nothing happened. We just basically plucked together a few probability distributions that make up how I think my data is structured. Now, it's often a good idea to start the sampler from a good position. And for that, we're gonna just optimize the log probability of the model using find map for find the maximum a posterior value. And then I'm gonna instantiate the sampler I wanna use. There are various you can choose from. Here I'm using a slice sampler, which, is, um, which works quite well for these simple models. And now I actually wanna draw the samples from the posterior, right? And for that, I call the sample function. And I tell it how many samples I want, 10,000. I provide it with the step method and I give it the starting value. And when I do this call, it'll take a couple of seconds to run the sampling algorithm and then it will return the structure to which I call trace here. And that is essentially a dictionary for each random variable that I have assigned, I will get the samples that were drawn. And now that I ran that, I can inquire about my posterior, right? So here I'm using Seaborn, which just as an aside is an awesome plotting library on top of Matplotlib. Uh, you should definitely check it out. It creates very nice statistical plots. For example, it has that nice disk plot function that basically just creates a histogram, but one that looks much nicer and has, for example, this uh, nice shaped line. And I give it the samples that I drew, that my MCMC sampling algorithm drew, of theta A and theta B, and then it will plot the posterior now that I created. And that is, again, that combination of my prior belief updated by the data that I've seen, and now I can reason about that. And the first thing to see is, um, well, the theta B, the probability of, or the chance of that uh, algorithm beating the market is 60%, and that's what I used to generate the data, so that's good that we get that back, and again, that's why we use simulated data to know actually that we're doing the right thing. And uh, the other one is around 50% or 49%. The other thing, uh, to note is that here now, instead of just having that single number that seemingly fell from the sky that we would get if we just take the mean, we have our confidence estimate, right? We know how wide that distribution is. We can answer many questions about that, like how likely is it that the, that the chance of success for that algorithm is 65%? And then we, we get a specific number out that that represents our level of certainty. On and we can do other interesting things like hypothesis testing to answer our initial question, which of the two actually does better? And for, for this, we can just compare the number of samples that were drawn for theta A to the samples of theta B. So we're just gonna ask, well, how many of those are larger than the other one? And that will tell us, well, with a probability of 99.11%, algorithm B is better than A. And that is exactly what we want, right? So by consistently having our confidence estimate carried through from the beginning to the end, gives us that benefit of everything we say uh, has that confidence and probability estimate associated with it. 
Okay, so that was super boring up until now. Hopefully it gets a little bit more interesting now. Um, so consider the case where instead of just two algorithms, we might have 20, and that is uh, more what we have on, on Quantopian. Many users have these algorithms, and maybe we wanna know not only each individual algorithm's the chance of success, but also the algorithms overall, the, the group average, are they also doing, um, are they also consistently beating the market or not? So the easiest model you can probably build is just the one we did before, but instead of two theta A and B, we have 20 thetas, right? And while that's fair, and this is called an unpooled model, it's somehow unsatisfying, right? Because we probably assume that that these are not completely separate, right? If the, the algorithms work in the same market environment, some of them will have similar properties, some similar algorithms that they're using. So they will be related somehow, right? They will, be, they will have differences, but they will also have similarities. And this model does not incorporate that, right? There's no way of uh, what I learned about theta one, I would apply to theta two. The other extreme alternative would be to have a, a fully pooled model, where instead of assuming each one has its own random variable, I just assume one random variable for all of them. And that's also unsatisfying because we know that there is that structure in our data, and which we're not exploiting, and also, even though we might get group estimates, we could not say anything about a particular algorithm, how well that one did, right? So the solution, which I think is really elegant, is called a partially pooled or hierarchical model. And for that, we add another layer on top of the individual random variables, right? Up until here, we only have the, the model we had before with all these independently, but what we can do is, instead of placing a, a fixed prior on that, we can actually learn that prior for each of them and have a group distribution that will apply to all of them. And those models are really powerful and have very uh, many nice properties. One of them is, well, what I learned about theta one from the data um, will shape my group distribution, and that in turn will shape the estimate of theta two. So everything I learn about the individuals, I learn about the group, and what I learn about the group, I can apply to constrain the individuals. And uh, another example where, this, where we do this quite frequently is um, from my research on uh, say psychology, where we have um, a behavioral task that we where we test 20 subjects on, and often we don't have enough time to collect lots of data. So each subject by itself, the estimates we would get um, if we fit a model to to that guy, it will be will be very noisy. And that is a way to build a hierarchical model to basically learn from the group and apply that back to the group. So we will get much more accurate estimates for each individual. And that's very uh, a very nice property of these uh, hierarchical models. So here I'm just gonna generate, again, some data, and the, uh, essentially the data will be just an array, 20 times 300, 20 subjects, 300 trials, and will just be, each row is the binaries of each individual, right? And then for convenience, um, I also create this, this indexing mask that I will use in a second that might not make sense right now, um, and, but just keep at the back of your mind that um, basically I'm indexing the first row will be just an index for the first subject and indexing into that random variable. But this is the data that we're gonna work with. Okay, so how does that model look like in PyMC3? So, here I'm gonna first create my group variables, the group mean and group scale, so how, what's the, what's the average rate, the, the average chance of beating the market of all algorithms, and how variant, variable are they? That's gonna be the, the scale parameter, and this is a, a choice you make in modeling, which price you wanna use here, I used a gamma distribution, and for the variance I use a, uh, sorry, I use a beta distribution for the group mean and I use a gamma distribution because variance can only be positive um, with, with certain parameters, but the details of that are not that critical. Then 
Unfortunately, uh, the beta distribution is parameters in terms of an alpha and a beta parameter, and not in terms of a mean and a variance. Fortunately, there's this very simple transformation we can do to these mean and variance parameters to convert them to alpha and beta values that I'm doing here. And while the specifics of that are not important, I just wanted to show how easy it is. And if you use some other languages, that's not a given that you can just really very freely combine these random variables and transform them and, and still have it work out. And the reason is that these are just these Theano expression graphs that once I multiply them, it will actually take the probability distributions or the, the formula and combine that and actually do the math in the background of, of combining that. So then I need to hook that up with the with the thetas, with my um, random variables for each algorithm. And instead of having a for loop and just generating 20 of them, I can pass in the shape argument, and that will generate a vector of, ran of 20 random variables um, that will be theta. So this is not a single one, but actually 20 ones. And before, we will note that I had just my hard-coded prior of five and five, here, right, in the previous model. But now I'm replacing that with the, the group estimates that I, that I also gonna learn about. And now, again, my data is gonna be Bernoulli distributed, and for the probability now, I'm gonna use that index that I showed you before, and essentially that will index into this vector in a way so that it will turn that into a two-dimensional array of the same shape as my data, and then uh, it, it matches it one-to-one, -one and it just does the right thing. And then I pass in that 2D array of the rows of binary variables for each algorithm. And again, I'm running, I'm finding Google starting point, and note here that I'm using now this uh, called nuts sampler, which is uh, this state-of-the-art sampler that uses the gradient information and works much better in complex models. Specifically, these hierarchical models are often very difficult to estimate, but the, this type of sampler does a much better job, and that was one of the reasons, actually, to, to uh, develop PyMC3. Okay. Oops. And then with the trace plot command, we can just create a plot, so don't mind about the right side. Uh, but here now we get our estimates of the group mean, and again, we have not a single value, but rather the, the confidence. So on average, we think it's about 46%. Um, we have the scale parameter, and we have 20 individual um, algorithms, right? So that would be theta 1 to theta 20, and all of them constraining each other in that model. So that's pretty cool. So to wrap up, I uh, hope I convinced you that probabilistic programming is pretty cool and that it allows you to tell a generative story about your data, right? And if you listen to any tutorial on how to be a good data scientist, it is telling stories about your data, right? So how, but how can you tell stories if you, all you have is that black box inference algorithm? So I think that's where probabilistic programming is, is uh, really quite an improvement. You don't have to worry about inference. These black box algorithms um, work pretty well. You have to know how they, what it looks like if they fail, uh, and, and it can be tricky then to get it going, so it's not, uh, it's not super trivial, but still, um, they, they often work out of the box. And lastly, PyMC3 gives you these advanced samplers. Um, I'm gonna skip that and go to further reading. So check out Quantopian if you want to design algorithms that have hopefully a higher chance than 50% of beating the market. Um, for some content on PyMC3, actually I have written a couple of blog posts on that, and currently that's probably the best resource for getting, getting started. And uh, mainly that's just because there is not that much else written about PyMC3 in terms of documentation. And down here, these, um, uh, also some really good resources that I recommend to, to learning about that. So thanks a lot. Yes, please. Hey, uh, 
So um, we have to study and um, Yeah, so, um, so the question is, Stan provides a lot of tools for um, assessing convergence and many diagnostics, but also very nice feature of transforming the variables and placing bounds on that. And I th so PIMC3 has uh, like the most common um, statistics that you want to look at, like the Gelman Rubin R hat statistic and all of that, and you can sample in parallel and then compare. Um, and you can, and we do have support for transformed variables. It's not like as um, polished as Stan, just because it's still in alpha. But yeah, it's there, and you can and you can bound your parameters. Um, so yeah, that that works, but it's yeah not quite as streamlined yet. More questions? Sure. So um, you now say I have a, a real life model, and I can. Great question. So the question was, um, I can't use this sampler that we provide here, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, because it's too expensive to use. So uh, how difficult would it be to use my own sampler? And that I think is a big benefit of PIMC3 is that you just basically inherit from the sampler base class and then you overwrite the step method and then you have you can do your own proposals and acceptance and rejections. So that's very easy. And if you look at Stan, for example, uh, I, I haven't done it, but uh, I imagine that it's quite difficult just when I look at the code, it's, uh, it's really hardcore C++ and all the templates make my head hurt. Um, and the other question, uh, if I understood you correct, was um, like if you can't evaluate the likelihood, or yeah, just if I can't use. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So. So I, I will put on this. Yep. So uh, the cool thing about Stan is that you know it's super fast, and if I if I write a step method for for an assumption algorithm, and this will be a Python method, you call it, you know hundreds of thousands of iterations about how does this this. So the question is how. Does it compare speed-wise, I guess? Or if you write your own sample in Python, won't that be slow? Um, and so I think most of the time is actually not spent in the sampler, but rather in evaluating the log likelihood of the model. And also, the gradient computation is very difficult. And it's true that Stan is, is fast, but one, uh, it's fast once it gets started. But uh, it takes quite a while to compile the model, actually. Um, so. In, in that sense, um, I haven't really done the speed comparison, and we recently have noticed some areas where PIMC3 is not fast, uh, and we need to fix those and, and speed it up. Um, and certainly the Stan guys have done a lot to really make a shine, and that's the benefit of having C++, but on the other hand, um, one benefit, I think, to Theano is that it does all these simplifications to the compute graph and does like clever caching, and you can even run it on the GPU. So um, I th we haven't really explored that to the fullest extent yet, but I think uh, there's lots of potential speed ups that just Theano could give us. Um, and another answer to your question is, well, if, if you, for example, you really spend that much time in your sampler um, of just proposing jumps, you could also use Cython, for example, and, and code your sampler in that. Yes. Uh, the question is about parallel sampling, and that is uh, possible. So there is just a p sample function instead of the sample function, and that will distribute the model. It doesn't quite work in every instance yet, but um, yeah, it uses multiprocessing, so um, you get true parallelization, and. Just as an aside, there's this really cool project that someone on the mailing list just wrote about that is about PIMC2, but the same trick could be applied to PIMC3, and he uses uh, Spark 
um, to basically do the sampling in parallel on, on big data, like if you have data that doesn't fit on a single machine, you can run individual samplers on subsets of the data in parallel and then aggregate them. And Spark lets you do that very nicely, and he basically hooked up um, PyMC and, and Spark. So that's really, really exciting. I'll show you a bit of time, but um, you can ask questions. Totally. So let's give him a big round of applause. Thanks so much.